Okay, Sabra, when we get started. Okay, so uh, I rented someone's house. In the lease, it says that I'm responsible for all damage to the house. And unfortunately, lo and behold, I uh, accidentally left on a blech and left the house or my wife lit Shabbos candles and left the house. The curtains caught fire. The apartment or the house went up in smoke. And the landlord, the owner of the home, comes to see me, keeps his cool. And the question becomes, what's my achrayas? I signed on the lease that I'm liable the only thing is, is that he tells me he has an insurance policy that completely covers fire damage. So I say to him, well, if you've got an insurance policy, then I guess that means I'm off the hook. And he says, not so fast. You signed a, a lease commitment. Normally, you're not hired for damage to Karka. But if you sign that you are, then what do you do? Or here's another case. Let's say um, we get into a fender bender and I rear end your car. Clear, open and shut case. I wasn't thinking, I wasn't looking, I was going too fast and I rear ended you. And uh, now you have uh, fender work that needs to be done, repaired. It could be hundreds and if not thousands of dollars of repair. So uh, you say to me, I'd like you to pay for the insurance. I'd like you to pay for the cost. And I say, well, let's have the insurance cover it. It's a no-fault insurance in Ontario, isn't it? Is it no-fault insurance? Yeah. 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 So, so, uh, so you say, I'd rather go out of insurance because I don't want my premiums to go up. So who prevails in that kind of situation? We're two from a Yidden. I don't want to have to pay out of pocket. I'd rather your insurance and my insurance will cover it. I'm confident that uh, I'm prepared to shoulder whatever increases in the premiums that may go up, maybe my first offense. But you uh, have uh, lots of experience with accidents. You know that they're going to, they're going to shoot up your premiums because of the fact that I, I rear-ended you. So uh, who's correct in a halacha situation like that? So these are very complicated shilas. I want you to know that it's not as simple as it seems. And a lot of it has to do with, in the areas of Chosh and Mishpat, which you're, if you're doing the daf, you're learning about, you're learning Bava Metzia now, and you're learning a lot about damages, and you learn Bava Kama also. So the question is, when I damage you, what do I, my obligation for payment, is that to make you whole? Or is it the Torah's demand that whatever I damage, I have to pay for? Lamaynaf gamina, what's the difference? Well, insurance is a great example. Um, if my obligation is to pay for what I damage, then it should be irrelevant whether or not you have uh, an insurance policy. It's my obligation to pay for whatever I damaged. And even if another party is covering that loss, I still have an obligation to pay. Or you could argue that my obligation as a mazik is only to make you whole after having caused the loss. If there's another mechanism that makes you whole, so then why should I have to pay if you're being made whole from some other source? Now, of course, that would have limits to it, right? Uh, let's say um, I damage a very wealthy person. And every time, like I damage Richie Rich's car in the comic books. So every time something breaks, his father just buys him a brand new car, brand new model. Can I say, well, I haven't really damaged you because based on your wealth, 
it makes no difference that you have a dent in your car. You'll just get a whole new car and it won't make a dent in your, in your Yerusha. We don't say that, right? We say that the mazik is chayib to pay regardless. So this is why insurance policies are so complicated because it sort of takes away to a certain degree the mazik's sense of responsibility to pay for something. What if that's the convention that anyone who owns an automobile or anyone who owns a home has to get homeowner's insurance, automobile insurance to protect both one who is damaged and one who damages to make sure that people will not be so uh, wiped out after causing or receiving damage? Does that change the halacha as far as a mazik and a nizik? So we're going to touch on some of these issues this evening, and I just want to get the basics, and we're going to end up with some tzarechians, because it's really not so simple. The, um, the one Gemara that some of the posts can bring up is as follows. There's a Mishnah in Maseches Bavakama at the end that says as follows. Shotaf nachal chamoro v'chamor chavero. A river sweeps away Ruvain and Shimon's respective donkeys. And Shalo Yafimana, the Shal Chavero Masayim. Shimon's donkey is only worth 100, but Ruvain's donkey is worth 200. And there's only an opportunity. Ruvain's an older man. He's not going to run after the donkey, swim down shore, downstream. But Shimon decides to make a deal with Ruvain. If Shimon goes ahead and decides, you know what, I'll save Ruvain's donkey because it's worth more. So what is Shimon entitled to for having sacrificed his donkey? So the Mishnah says, Shimon's just entitled to compensation for having done the work, like a laborer, bless you, saving the donkey. But Shimon is not entitled to any compensation for his lost donkey that he chose to not retrieve in order to save Ruvain's donkey. Why? Because he didn't consult Ruvain first. By contrast, is the second case in the mission. But if Shimon said, if you want, I can forsake my $100 donkey and save your $200 donkey, do we have a deal? Okay, then Chayav Litenlo. If Ruvain agrees to the deal, then Ruvain will have to compensate Shimon for the loss of his donkey. Because Shimon essentially is basically saying, Chaval, that you should lose 200, right? So I'll make a deal with you. We'll split the loss, right? You pay me for my, for my lost donkey. You'll get your whole donkey back, right? And that way you'll at least... At least you won't lose all 200. You'll only lose 100 that you're going to pay me. And uh, I'll be made whole, and you'll be only out of 100. If I save my donkey, I'll get my $100 do donkey back, and you won't get anything. So for Reuven, it makes sense to do this deal. Okay? So what do we see from this halacha? So let's see. There's another question that arises. Uh, as a corollary of this halacha in the Mishnah. The Gemara, on the following page, asked the following question. Source number two. Rav Kahana Rav. Yorad mahu. So Shimon has already made the deal with Reuven. You're going to pay me $100 if I save your donkey that's worth $200. Lo and behold, Shimon saves Reuven's donkey. Five minutes later, Shimon's donkey miraculously finds its way on, onto shore. So Ruve now says, why should I pay you for your donkey? The whole deal was that you would forsake, you would forego saving your donkey in order to save my donkey. Now that your donkey is also saved, I made whole, you're made whole, why should I pay you the $100? What do you think the halacha is? Shimon says, we had a deal. I was going to save your donkey. You're going to give me a hundred bucks for my loss. So what do you think the halacha should be? Who's right, Shimon or Ruvain? 
Mahu Amarle Mishamaya Rachimu Ale. So the Gemara answers very curiously. It says that Ruvain still has to pay a hundred dollars to Shimon because they made a business arrangement that in exchange for Shimon saving Ruvain's donkey, Ruvain would compensate him a hundred dollars. I it was only with the understanding that Shimon was going to lose a hundred dollars. That's none of Ruvain's business. Ruvain committed himself to pay the hundred bucks, and Mishamaya Rachimu Ale, and um, uh, Ruvain, uh, Shimon was the object of heavenly mercy. And so Hashem decided to give him a kiss and give him his donkey back. But because Shimon was prepared to lose his donkey and Ruvain was prepared to pay him for his lost donkey, that business arrangement still is binding. Okay? What are we trying to learn from this case now? Are we, are we starting to see where this is leading us? Where are we going with this? How would you apply this to insurance? Shemayim, is it like a present from Shemayim? Yeah. And basically the, basically the Nizik, the injured party, can say to the Mazik, listen, you have an obligation as a Mazik to pay me. It's none of your business that the insurance is going to cover what they're going to cover. Uh, you have to pay me. What about the fact that now there may be insurance fraud? Is there is there insurance fraud? Because on the one on, on the one hand, you can look at the is the insurance responsible for making whole, or is the insurance responsible for if the house burns down, they have to pay for the loss, regardless of whether Ruven is able to retrieve money from the mazik or not? Yes, Archie. We're not talking about where the Mazik contracted with an insurance company. The Mazik, main, if you're a renter, if you're a tenant, right? Sometimes you'll get tenant insurance, but not always. The homeowner has homeowner's insurance. The tenant may say, I don't need to get tenant insurance. I'll just rely on the homeowner's uh, homeowner's insurance policy. So we're not we're not talking about a case where the tenant has his own insurance. Okay. Okay. So this is the Shiloh we're dealing with, and it helps us to solidify in our minds what the obligation of the mazik is. Okay. So, um, and the Gemara then continues, and it says, "Ki hader Rav Safra hava ka'azil b'shayirasa." Rav Safra was once traveling in a caravan. When you travel in a caravan, you traveled in numbers in order to avoid getting attacked by animals or highwaymen. So, lavinhu hahu ari. And so, a lion decided to accompany them. And I don't know how this worked. Apparently, the lion was under the uh, agreement of the group that the lion was not going to eat them as long as they kept the lion well fed. So every night they threw, they tossed a donkey to the lion, and that kept the lion happy. And the lion kept accompanying them, not eating them, as long as they kept the lion well fed. So one night it turned out, I guess they took lots every night whose turn it was. Monday night, it was Rav Safra's turn to give up his donkey. And lo and behold, Rav Safra gives the lion his donkey. And the lion decides, I'm not going to eat this donkey. I'm not hungry. Monday night. So Rav Safra went back ahead and took and repossessed his donkey. Now, Amrle Ravachami Difta La Ravina Lamale Lamiski Be Nehidhi Afkare Adaita Dari Afkare. Why did Rav Safra have to repossess the donkey? What, what the Gemara is basically proving from here is that sometimes you get a heavenly gift and you've dispensed with your legal obligation, but that doesn't exempt other people from their legal obligation. So just because I got to keep my donkey 
doesn't mean that I now have to sell my donkey and distribute it to the other people. No, each one of us had to give up his donkey. If Hashem decided that the night that I have to give up my donkey, that the lion's not hungry, that's not my problem. And therefore, I get to keep my donkey. Or it just asks, why did Rav Safra have to take, re, have to repossess his donkey? It wasn't really Hefker. So the Gemara answer is, Amalei Rav Safra le Ravcha de Milsa hu Gemara says, says, Inachinami, you're right. Rav Safra didn't have to actually technically repossess his donkey. He didn't make it totally Hefker when he gave the donkey to the lion. He only made it Hefker as far as um, as far as the lion would be permitted to eat it, but not, but not for him. Now that we have this Gemara in our pocket, and the Gemara basically is suggesting that there are many times when a person can get a double benefit. He can get the benefit from the party that owes him money based on a business arrangement, even if the business arrangement was working under the assumption that the person was going to lose out and he ended up not losing out, you can get double double payment. You can get payment from the, and that's really what we're going to try to prove from this Gemara. So Rav, Rav Meir Simcha of Dvins, the Or Sameach, and the, you know, who's also the Meshech Achma, he has a commentary uh, um, on this halacha. And he asks, this is now the 19th century is where, in, you know, taking out insurance policies really started to take off. So this is where these shilas start. It says, Following Shaila, a tenant rents a house and he signed on the contract that he is liable for any fire damage. Then the homeowner, the guy, the landlord who owns the home, went ahead and got a fire insurance policy on the house. And the house burned down. So could the, the tenant now turn around to the homeowner and say, you haven't lost anything because the insurance is paying you for the loss. So it wasn't on that uh, that understanding that I accepted to to pay you. I accepted only to pay you based on the fact that if I if the house burnt down, I would have to make you whole. But since you've been made whole by the insurance company, I'm not going to pay you. So we'll skip the brackets. And he says, "Venirali ladun the hasocher chayiv b'tashlume acharayusa." That uh, or Sameach suggests that the tenant should still have an obligation to pay. Based on the Gemara of where uh, Shimon and Ruvain each have a donkey, both get swept down the stream. And if it turns out that Shimon agrees to save Ruvain's donkey at his own expense, then Ruven, if, if Ruvain pays him for his donkey, the hundred bucks, then uh, then Ruvain has to pay. And he quotes the Gemara, that if a miracle takes place, that after Shimon saves Ruvain's donkey, Shimon's donkey on its own, manages to uh, struggle itself itself onto shore, so then Ruvain still is not off the hook. Ruvain still has to pay him the $100 because that was a gift from heaven. So Alma, the Hadi Kibel Achrayas, whom he shum de Machmas de Matzila shall Chavero, Mafsid Chamor shall Atzmo, the Lasof lo Hifsides shall Atzmo, the Alame Elav. So he says, you could argue that the whole reason that Reuven accepted to pay the $100 to Shimon is because he wanted to make Shimon whole for the loss that Shimon was going to incur by saving Reuven's donkey. And then, then he wants, and then, you know, you could argue. In the end, Shimon didn't lose anything because the donkey was able to climb back up onto ground. Nonetheless, Reuven does not have the ability to make that claim. 
can't make the claim, well, I only agreed to pay you the $100 based on my assumption that you were going to lose your donkey. I'm sorry. Once you make a, a, a commitment to pay the $100, you got to pay the $100. The Matzi Amarle, my ichbas lach bema, the mash, the mishamay rachimu alai. Because the Shimon could say that, what difference is it to you? Like, what business is it of yours that God decided to have Rahmanas on me and give me my donkey as the side hustle, right? It's got nothing to do with the agreement that you made to pay me $100 if I would save your donkey. Kol Shekin Your Sameach says, well, that should certainly be true in a case where a person insures his home and then rents it to a tenant. Sha'al yedei ma'ashenotein schar kitzvato lechebrat achrayut hirviach betashlumi beisa. The, the homeowner decides, you know what, I'm going to uh, uh, pay a policy, and that's my side hustle. In other words, I can sleep securely at night knowing that my tenant will pay me for any damage that happens to my house. I happen to have a, a side hustle, which is that I took out an insurance policy, so that if the insurance policy, if the house burns down, I'll collect a second time from the insurance that, that's, that has no bearing as the Or Sameach, on the obligation of the tenant. And therefore, in that situation, the Socher, the tenant, has not, cannot claim exemption just because the landlord has been made whole by the insurance. Or just in case the tenant doesn't have the money to pay. This is, I mean, they actually plan through. They don't have to plan. They just do the plan. You know what I mean? If, 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 if your land is burning down and there's two insurance policies, that, that's not that's not like they don't keep just, they happen to be saved and that's it. And your mind gives you the check. That's just like, I don't see that. You don't see the, the, the comparison to the, to the case in the Gemara. Um, well, you're right. In one case, a person took the initiative to, to insure himself. And in the case of the Gemara, he didn't do anything to insure himself, but rather Hashem granted him a gift. That's the only difference, though, between the two. The fact of the matter that, that, that what the Rav Meir Simcha is trying to draw from this Gemara, that the fact that, the, uh, that Shimon gains from his donkey still being alive, has nothing to do with the commitment that Ruvain made to him to pay him $100 for saving his donkey. And so in the same vein, the tenant committed himself to pay for fire damage. It's got nothing to do with the insurance policy that Shimon, that uh, the, the, the landlord decide, the homeowner decides to take on his own. So, so that's the commonality between the two. You're right. There's still a difference that one is Mishamayim, and the other one is prudent, like you said, prudent financial planning. But that's at least the commonality that Rav Meir Simcha wants to draw between the two cases. Okay, um, I'm not going to go into the Maharsham. He has a different Raya, um, but, I'm, but you may want to look at that at your own time. I want to go instead to source number six, because this stuff is so complicated. It's a little bit, I, I just don't want to go into too much text. But I want to go into source number six, which is the Shaila Suchuvas Hare Bisamim, who is actually Mishpach of mine. Uh, he was um, Rav Avraham Horovitz, um, the Hare Bisamim. He was the Rav of Stanislav. He's my first cousin three times removed. Third, third, you know, what is it, three, three times. For, but, he's a, but he's a first cousin. He lived uh, into the early 20th century. So basically, my great, great, great uncle's son. Okay, very important post sake because he's my relative after all. Okay, so he says, "Va'alderech she'ela." So my, my great, great, great grandfather was also from the Aharowitz post sake. He was in another town. He was in Pshemishal. For the, and uh, he was also, but he was also a big posek as well. Valderech she'ila be'echad shahaya beso isas kerort 
I, I'm not sure if I'm not if I'm pronouncing it right, but that's the Yiddish word for insurance, or maybe it's the Hungarian. I have no idea what or Polish. I, I don't even know what that word is. Access korart, or maybe it has to do with assessment. I, I have no idea. It's not Yiddish. Okay. Okay. So maybe it's a Polish word. Maybe it's because uh, this was in Galicia. I don't know. So pirish nivutach. It means that it was uh, a person's house was insured. Shebeim yisare if yishalmalu bale ha ases korans kach vekach that uh, the insurance company would pay out a certain amount if his house burns down. That was the arrangement. He took out a policy. Turns out that his neighbor's house burned down and the neighbor's house caused his house to catch on fire. So the neighbor now is really liable, right? So the kibel de menisco may ha ss korans. And so the fellow collects on his fire insurance policy. He says, but you, neighbor, still have to pay me because you were negligent. You left the, the stove on and you left the house or you left the Shabbos candles or the Hanukkah candles burning and you left the house and the house burned down and now you burned down my house. Because your insurance paid for it, so why should I have to pay you if your house was insured? Okay, so who, so who is the correct? Who is correct? So he starts off by starts starts off by saying that there's a whole sichsuch in the achronim whether we adjudicate laws of or and esh bizman hazet. This is a big discussion in the poskim whether if a person is responsible for nizke esh whether he can be litigated against in a based in Bichlal Bizman Hazeh. And he brings down a series of poskim who say, Kulam Kasvu didan in Eish Ubor Bizman Hazeh. So we're skipping to the third line after those periods, dots. So he says, so therefore, I feel that this is a fair shaila to, to discuss. Efes baha yesh lanu ladun benidon didan, but here's the issue. The Balabas, whose house burned down, has, has incurred no real damage because at the end of the day, the insurance came in Shekibel Tashlume Nizko Meas Eskorans because he got his insurance payment from the insurance company. So he's not out of pocket anything. I mean, obviously it's an inconvenience. He'll have to rebuild his house. But, you know, Lamaisa, there's no fin real financial loss. The Lichora Yesh Lomar, the Motsi Balabayas Lomar, the Balha Esh, Baloch Shesi Muftach Beaskarans, Min Shemai Rahimo Live, and Istavi Shia Kane, but Sarahatel Shalim Linis Kayesh. But maybe no, maybe you could say that the homeowner can turn around to the neighbor and say, the fact that I insured my house has nothing to do with your obligation. It's no different than if heaven had mercy on me and gave me a pile of money from heaven, right? The fact is, you still owe me as a mazik for having burned down my house. Just like the Gemara that we just quoted above. And he quotes the Gemara, and we're going to skip the quotes, and we'll go to the next paragraph. Omnam, he says, however, I believe that the two cases are not comparable. He says, because let's think about it. In the case of the Gemara, where Shimon says, I'll save your donkey, Ruvain, instead of my own, at that moment when they made the business deal that Reuven agreed to pay him a hundred bucks for the loss of his donkey, his donkey, Taka, was lost at that moment. Okay? 
v'nischayev heich lishlumele. And at that moment, that's when Reuven, his his chayvus, his obligation to pay Shimon, set in. It doesn't get removed. And therefore, the fact that Shimon was able to retrieve his donkey later, seemingly like miraculously, it's like him getting something from Hefker. It's not that like he never lost his donkey. He did taka lose his donkey. He lost $100 worth of his assets by saving Ruvain's donkey. And only afterwards, he was able to miraculously find another $100 donkey, which happened to be the same donkey that was lost. But at that moment when they made the deal, that donkey was taka avud. It was actually lost based on his ability to save Ruvain's donkey. He says, Masha'in, I'm just skipping a few words. Masha'in came binidon didan. But in our case of my neighbor's house burning down my house, kaven dime olam, lo havale hezek, achare shekibel mehas korans, lama yeshalem lo ze dime beto. Listen to the svara of Rav Horovitz. It says, but in this case, the moment my house burns down, the insurance company has to pay me. So there has not been any moment where I've actually been bereft of my money. There hasn't been a moment where I've been bereft of my money because the moment the house burns down, the insurance policy kicks in, the insurance company owes me a million bucks now for my home. So that, therefore, he says, I have never at any point been bereft of my house or the value of my house such that we can say that the neighbor has caused me financial loss. That's, the, that's his argument. And we're going to see that uh, Rav Bloy Zatzal um, isn't, wasn't really happy with this argument. When you cause damage, you might bring it back up to the car or lay on it. Yeah. Yeah, it, there was no there, he says, yeah, this guy was never damaged. It was never damaged because Lamaisa continuously, I have a house. Five minutes later, my house is burned down. But at that moment that my house is burned down, there's now a chiyuv from the insurance company to pay me. So at no point am I at a loss of a million dollar asset. That's that, That's his argument. And then he says, I'll give you another argument. He says, Argument I think that you want to be trying to distinguish. The Rav says another argument. He says that look at the case of the Gemara, that it happened on its own from heaven, that the donkey was like miraculously survived. But he says, in our case, where a person proactively, like he says, is financially prudent and takes out a policy on his house, lest it burn down, he does that deliberately so that he won't have to run after a mazik who burns down his house. So he's basically protecting himself the entire time. Which is really a good way of saying financial, financial prudence. He took it upon himself to insure himself. And therefore, essentially, he basically was making a, 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 a tacit declaration that I am letting any mazik off the, I'm not going after a mazik. I'm going to cover myself so that if my house burns down, I won't go after a mazik. I'll just collect the money from the insurance company. And it's got nothing to, it's not a side hustle. It's basically a, a, an implicit understanding that I'm not going to go after the mazik. Whereas when a person makes a deal with Reuven with the donkey and then out of no effort of his own, Hashem lets him save his own donkey. 
that's uh, that's considered a side hustle, and therefore, uh, and therefore he gets to keep both the hundred dollars from Ruvain and the donkey. Umilvadze heich yuchal lomar habalabayis mazoli gorem shaata hichsharta es nizki uteshalimli, and besides which. How can the balabas, the guy whose house burned down, say to the to say to the neighbor, "My mazel caused me to to me be made whole by the insurance policy." Why can't the the shachain whose house caused the fire? He could say, "It wasn't your mazel." That protected you, that uh, caused you to uh, be made uh, uh, to to be able to get the insurance premium, and therefore uh, I still have to pay you. It was my mazel that when my house burned down, it burnt down another my neighbor's house who already was protected by insurance. Whereas you can look at the mazel either way in a case where a person proactively got an insurance policy. Okay. Anyway, he goes on. And um, and his conclusion is, and we'll skip the next paragraph. We'll go to the final paragraph. He says, "Omnam zebarur." What one thing is clear: the im ein habayis muvtach kol kach behas es korans. Let's say the insurance policy only covers eighty percent of the damage, or there's a deductible. Then he says, what's clear is then for sure the, the neighbor who, who is responsible for the fire will have to either cover the deductible or pay whatever shortfall there is from the insurance payment. He says, because the Balabayas, the, the guy whose house got burned down, says that if you do nothing and you don't pay me, the insurance company is going to come after you and they're going to try to make you pay for having burned down the house. In other words, there's also the matter of the insurance company sometimes having the ability to go after the cause of the of the fire. Uve, um, uve, Sure, what that abbreviation is. Okay, I'm not sure what the rest of the tshuva is going to say, but in any event, Rav Harovitz clearly says that his opinion is just the opposite. He comes to the opposite conclusion of the Or Sameach. The Or Sameach says that you, the, the case of the Gemara is analogous to a case of a person having an insurance policy. And therefore, just like in the case of the Gemara, just because Hashem gave me a donkey doesn't let you off the hook for paying me what you promised to pay me for foregoing my donkey. You still have to pay me the $100. So too, over here, just because I have an insurance policy does not let you off the hook from having to pay me for the damage you caused. Whereas the Hare Bisamim, Rav Horovitz, says just the opposite. In a case of Mishamayim Rachimu Alei, that's heaven that, has, that awarded you that donkey miraculously. And furthermore, in that situation, the deal was made at a time when Shimon Taka didn't have a donkey. He had lost the donkey at that moment. And therefore, Reuven is chayef based on his lost donkey. The fact that, that later he was able to get that donkey back after it was lost does not in any way affect the um, does not in any way affect Reuven's obligation to him. But in the case of an insurance policy, at no moment is the homeowner at uh, bereft of his investment because before the fire he's got a million dollar house and after the fire he's got a million dollar debt that's owed to him by the insurance company let's take a look at the bloy safer pischei choshen we'll just take a look at it um, and he's going to quote rebel Khanan basserman for us for just a moment so first of all he says das kama poskim shimhoya hachefetz mevutach apol pi shahamafkid mekabel pitzui mechevrat bituach 
Okay, so there is an opinion, or, or the opinion of many poskim is that even if a person has an item that is insured, that does not let the shomer who was negligent and allowed it to get destroyed or stolen, does not make him off the hook from having to compensate for his negligence. Now, it's a very vague statement because it doesn't say how much he has to pay. It doesn't say to whom he has to pay. Does he have to pay the insurance company? Or does he get, does the own does the owner of the item get to collect twice? Do, was that called double indemnity or double? No, that's the double dipping or what? Yeah. It means, means. Yeah, okay. So it's it's some somehow related. But here, so Reploy is very vague. He just says that insurance, the insur the fact that an item was insured does not in any way mitigate the obligation of a mazik or a shomer who was negligent from having to pay his responsibility. Now, he brings the tshuva from the Hare Bissamim, who clearly does not hold that way. The Hare Bissamim's feeling was, as you saw, that as long as a guy is made whole by his insurance, he's sort of tacitly letting the mazik off the hook, right? So he says, V'lichora hadimyon la'ola chamor... What? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, if you can demonstrate that at some point there was a loss. Now... But, but that's his whole argument, that an insurance policy, by definition, right, means that you never have a loss, because that's the whole reason for getting an insurance policy. Well, the assessor comes and... They... Yes, there is. You, you, you could make the argument that I don't have a place to live right now, right? But as far as my financial holdings are concerned, I still have sort of like the confidence that I haven't lost anything. That's his argument, at least. Whether or not it holds water based on this argument you've just mentioned, Cyril, I'm not so sure. But Rav Bloy is also bothered by the argument of the Hare Bissamim. He says, <laughs> He says this whole comparison or analogy to the case of the donkey uh, miraculously coming up on its own, he says it's very bizarre. Because Shimon, at the end of the day, ends up not having incurred any loss because he gets his donkey back. It's true that temporarily he didn't have a donkey, right? That was the argument of the Hare Bissamim. But Lamaisa, Lamaisa, as at the end of the story, Shimon has not incurred any loss. Belochain, one second, Ilab Svara de Mishamay Rachimu, Hayamakam Lomar Shein Sarach Lashalim. And it's for that reason that you could make the argument, the, 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 the you know, why should Ruvain could, could make the argument, why should I have to pay? You haven't lost anything. You have your donkey back. And the answer that the Gemara gives is that no, that's a side hustle, that's from heaven. That's got nothing to do with you when you agree to pay. He says, yes, you could have made that argument, but the Gemara says we don't make that argument because Lamaisa, even though Shimon only temporarily lost his donkey but later retrieved it, Lamaisa, that was a gift from heaven and has nothing to do with Ruvain's obligation to cover the commitment that he made of $100 to pay for Shimon's donkey. But in the case of the fire, where the Shachain's house caused the Balabas's house to burn down, he says, you end up, you, you ended up, it's not like you lost a donkey temporarily and got it back. The house, Mamish, burned down. The house burned down. The hapitzoi mecherat habituach eno metaken es hanezek. So there's been damage. In other words, you, Shachain, ended up burning down my house. I have no house anymore. There has been real nezek. Now, the financial uh, 
uh, ramifications of that nezik are being covered by the insurance, but you're still a mazik. In other words, in the case of the Gemara, there's no mazik involved. Ruvain, Shimon's valor of saving Ruvain's donkey, turns out Ruvain had no negative impact on Shimon's donkey. But here, the Shachain had a negative impact on Ruvain's house, on the Balabas' house. He burnt it down. I, he's going to, the Balabas will be made whole by the insurance company, but the, but the Shachain is still a mazik. Okay? The insurance company is going made a side deal that they're going to pay because of the policy, the premium that he paid for the policy. Let me give you by analogy. A guy's house burns down because of your negligence. My relatives decide to rebuild my house. He says, says, Is there any svara to say that the mazik who burnt down my house can say, well, you're whole. You know, you got your money because your relative stepped in and built you a new house. So what do, what do I have to pay for? The answer is because you're a mazik. In other words, there is two, the, the hare besamim doesn't make sense, says Rav Lloyd. The fact is that a mazik has to pay, regardless of whether there is a financial deficit or loss to the nizik or not. If there's been damage, you have to pay. And you can't say, mishamaya rachimu alei. You can't say, oh, they had mercy on me from heaven. That only works when the, the heavenly mercy was that I was never damaged at all. I was only temporarily damaged. But when there's permanent damage and I'm made financially whole from some other source, that doesn't let you off the hook from being a mazik. That's what Floyd's argument. And then he brings the word and um, I'm not gonna we're not gonna have time to go into it, unfortunately. But, that's right. Exactly. That's the argument that Rav Bloy is making against the Hare Bissamim. The Hare Bissamim wanted to make an argument contrary to that. He wanted to make an argument that by virtue of the fact that I've taken out an insurance policy, I've exempted all mazikim, I've let all the my maziks off the hook. And, and I don't think Rav Bloy is having any of that. A mazik has an obligation to pay regardless of what measures a person that takes to insure himself from damage. If you damage, you still have to pay. So what it turns out, and this is how Rav Bloy poskins, that, and it seems to me this is the consensus of the poskim. If I damage you, if I cause you damage, then I can't, assuage my guilty conscience by saying, ah, you're covered by insurance. Now, this is, this has so many ramifications that we're probably not even thinking of. What if chas v'shalom, I cause you injury? And OHIP covers all your medical expenses, but you end up spending months in the hospital, right? So does that mean I'm off the hook because all of your medical expenses were taken care of? Licha or not? There's Sheves and Ripoy, time off from work, and um, maybe maybe I'm putter from Ripoy, but what about Boshes? What about, what? That's right. OHIP is so, yeah, it's the insurance company. Yeah, but, but no, but maybe you could argue that based on Dina de Malchusa, that anyone who lives in this province is implicitly off the hook for report, is off the hook for paying for medical expenses that are covered by social, by by net. L'cha'ora, you'd have to pay. L'cha'ora, you'd have to pay all of the other uh, things that a person, that, that my nezek caused. Um, yes. Um, but 
In other words, it's important to remember that that insur- insurance policies do not remove the stigma of being a mazik. That's really essentially what the maskana seems to be. So the ramifications would be that a person would have to pay a deductible. He has a halachic obligation that whatever the insurance doesn't cover has to be paid by the mazik. The mazik can't say, well, you know, you took out an insurance policy. Obviously, you were like the, you can't say like the hare besamim. That, well, obviously, the fact that you took out an insurance policy means that you were letting off all the mazikim, not at all. And even the Hari Basamim holds that if there's any shortfall in the insurance policy, the mazik has to pay. And also, you know, you know, um, this has other applications as well. Let's say, um, let's say the, uh, the, the person whose car got damaged says, I want to go outside of the insurance. Who has the, who, who is in the right? The person, he says, because if we go and we use my insurance, I've already got a number of cases against me, and they're going to jack up my So there's a lot more to discuss here, but this is sort of like a forspice for, for a future discussion about, it gets more complicated after this, and maybe I'll show you an article that goes even deeper into all of these uh, subjects. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. So, so does Ruben? So that Gemara says clearly not that way. The Gemara says that Ruben's hundred dollars is owed to Shimon, regardless of whether Shimon retrieves his donkey or not. Yeah, once, no, no, that's not the din of the Gemara. The din of the Gemara is that that was a matana from Hashem. Hashem gave Shimon a matana. It, it's still, no, it's not a matana for Ruvain. It's a matana for Shimon. If Hashem wanted to give a matana to Ruvain, he would have caused Ruvain's donkey to come out before he made a deal with Shimon. You know? Okay, so we'll hold it here. Yeah, yeah.